Uh, welcome to the African History Network show. It's Monday, February 7th, 2022. And we are live. We're giving an update on the uh, shooting of uh, Amir Locke in uh, Minneapolis, Minnesota. And the information that came out today, uh, it appears that the judge, Judge Peter Cahill, who was the judge over the uh, Derek Chauvin murder trial, it appeals that Judge Cahill was the judge uh, who likely signed the search warrant. OK, let's go to uh, clip number one, Shakita. The protesters took to the streets of Minneapolis over the weekend after a young black man was killed in a police shooting. Body cam footage shows the moment an officer shot 22-year-old Amir Locke while executing a no-knock search warrant. The shooting has reignited the controversy around no-knock searches and around the embattled Minneapolis Police Department nearly two years after the murder of George Floyd. NBC News correspondent Shaquille Brewster has been following this story. He joins us now. Shaq, good morning to you. So first, let's walk us through what we know about the shooting and the investigation into it. Good morning, Joe. And, you know, there are still many questions and many things that we don't know about this investigation as it continues into this week. But what we do know is that this is a shooting that happened early Wednesday morning as the Minneapolis Police Department was executing a no-knock search warrant on an apartment that 22-year-old Amir Locke was staying in. And this was a search warrant that was at the request of the St. Paul Police Invest uh, Department as part of a homicide investigation that they were participating in. But Minneapolis Police Department is the one who actually actually executed it and elevated it to a no-knock search warrant. Now, what we do know is that warrant did not name Amir Locke, and it's unclear if he was even connected to the investigation. That's something that we're still waiting to hear from that St. Paul Police Department. But you see in that body camera video that was just shown, an officer goes in or several officers go in, part of the SWAT team. They're unlocking the door there. They announce themselves once they're inside. An officer kicks the couch and Locke slowly gets up and that's when you see a gun. Now, he never fired that gun. Uh, as far as we know, uh, he had a legal a concealed carry permit, although that doesn't really matter because it's a private residence. But there's so many things we don't know about the entire situation, except that we can see most of it in that video that was provided by the Minneapolis Police Department. So, Shaq, we know the Minneapolis Police Department currently under investigation by the Justice Department to determine whether there's a pattern of discrimination in using excessive force. With that backdrop, tell us more about some of the protests we saw this weekend. What were people saying? And it's important to note that that investigation by the federal government, that was something that happened after the murder of George Floyd. So they have been under the scrutiny and facing pressure for some time now. And you see some of the images of the protests that we saw during the course of the week. And one thing I should note with that is you see hundreds of people there. This is also in the frigid cold in Minneapolis. Last night, you also had protesters um, participating in a caravan. We did hear from the parents of Amir hey, Locke hey, uh, right one of the Kita. protests. Pause right there. To what we heard. Pause right there. Okay, just back it up about 30 seconds or so. We're going to pick this up on the other side of the break. We're up against a break. Uh, we'll finish this on the other side of the break, and we'll talk about Brian Flores uh, suing the NFL. You listen to the African History Network show. I'm Michael M. Hotel. We'll be back in a few minutes. Welcome back to the African History Network show right here on 9, 10 a.m. The Superstation, the Future Radio. I'm your host, brother, Michael M. Hotel. It is Monday, February 7th, 2022. And we are live. Call in number is 313 778 7600. Is the call in number if you have a question or comment? Okay, be sure to visit our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. You can register for the online classes that I teach on the weekend, on Saturdays and Sundays. We have a bundle pack. You can register for both classes for only $120, and you can still watch the class even after the course is over with. Okay, so on, uh, on Sundays, it, uh, I teach ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, understanding the transatlantic slave trade, where they didn't teach you in school. All right, we do a thousands of years of history, what leads the transatlantic slave trade taking place. I do a PowerPoint presentation. We have book references, articles, video clips. We do this class 2 p.m. to 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. We had a great class this past weekend. As soon as you register, you can watch that class. So we do the sessions live. All the sessions are archived and recorded. You're going to get... Uh, 15 bonus lectures from me in digital format uh, when you register for this class also, okay? You'll get the uh, Michael M. Hotep uh, 15 uh, lecture uh, bundle pack. You'll get that in digital format. You can order the DVD uh, bundle from our website, africanhistorynetwork.com, but you'll get the uh, 
the digital, but uh, you'll get the lectures in digital format when you register for understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school. The second class I teach on Sundays, uh, this class is February 13th, from the Civil War to the Civil Rights Movement and Black Power, 1865 to 1968. OK, and we do that 2 p.m. to 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time as well. All right. So visit our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. We'll post a link here as soon as you register. You can start watching uh, the classes and you can join us in class this coming weekend. All right. So I want to go back to the story that we were uh, dealing with before the break. Um, so there were there were protests this um, past Saturday. We're going back to the clip here in just a second, Shakita. There were protests uh, this past Saturday over the uh, police killing of Amir Locke. And this is a good piece here from um, the New York Times. Minneapolis police released body camera footage of fatal shooting of black men. Uh, uh, um, oh, I'm sorry, this one here is, uh, we, need, uh, we need something different. I'm looking at a different article here. The other one I'm looking at is from uh, NBC News. This is from February 4th. This one right here from, New York, from the New York Times is from February 5th. Okay, uh, we need something different. Protesters march in Minneapolis after police killing. A large crowd of demonstrators gathered downtown uh, days after the fatal shooting of Amir Locke, 22 years old. And here's a, a there's hundreds of people out pro protesting uh, the police killing of Amir Locke, who was legally armed, wasn't pointing a gun at any police officers, no knock warrant. Uh, and they were there not to arrest somebody. They, they were there to recover property. Regard, it was in relationship to a homicide investigation. Amir Locke was not the target of the um, search warrant. He wasn't listed on the search warrant or anything like that. He was there at the apartment visiting his cousin. Okay. So uh, I want to go back to this clip here from uh, NBC News. Let's go back to the clip, uh, Shakita, giving an update on what, what's going on. Um, participating in a caravan. We did hear from the parents of Amir Alak, one of the protests. I want you to listen to what we heard from his mother. My son Amir, who is born and raised in the Twin Cities, law-abiding citizen, did everything he was supposed to do, was raised with morals and values, loved by so many. Everybody that came in contact with him, he had a beautiful spirit and a beautiful smile. Never would I have imagined that I would be standing up here talking about the execution of my son by the Minneapolis Police Department. I should not have to be here. His family on at a protest on Saturday is calling for 22 days of peace to honor their son, who, of course, was 22 years old when he was killed on Wednesday. We also know that this investigation is now in the hands of the state prosecutor. So it'll be up to the attorney general and his team uh, to determine whether or not there will be charges if he believes there should be charges. The city also halting no knock warrants until they can come up with a new policy. Shaq, thanks so much. Appreciate it. OK, uh, pause it right there. All right. So. This clip, uh, uh, this article here, New York Times. Um, so chanting the name of Amir Locke, a large crowd of protesters marched in frigid weather in downtown Minneapolis on Saturday to voice exasperation over the conduct of law enforcement officers nearly two years after the murder of George Floyd by the Minneapolis Police Department as well. Uh, Amir Locke was fatally shot in an early morning raid at an apartment complex on Wednesday. Uh, that was February 2nd, 2022, when a SWAT team for the Minneapolis Police Department, a SWAT team for the Minneapolis Police Department, carried out a search warrant involving a homicide for the police in nearby St. Paul, Minnesota. The Minneapolis Police Department was conducting this raid, carrying out a search warrant on behalf of the St. Paul Police Department. OK, uh, now Amir Locke was not named as a suspect in the warrant, according to authorities. 
He was not named as a suspect in the uh, in the warrant. He was not a sus he was not a suspect. Nor was he a resident of the apartment, according to Jeff Storms, a lawyer representing uh, Amir Locke's family, who said that Amir Locke was staying there with a cousin. Saying uh, saying his name, shouted protesters who marched together, who march uh, marching together, spanned more than one city block as they walked to uh, the police station in the first precinct. Some carried signs that read justice for Amir, uh, justice for Amir Locke and, and all stolen lives. And a uh, sign said, stop the war on black America. Now tensions over racial justice and police violence were already elevated in Minneapolis, Minnesota, the Twin Cities before the death of Amir Locke, who was African-American, the federal trial against the three former Minneapolis police officers who stood by as Derek Chauvin, uh, their superior officer, knelt on George Floyd's neck has been underway since January 24th. Now, the protest this past Saturday, which was February 5th, was a uh, peaceful uh, protest of, and followed, it followed a car protest in downtown Minneapolis, Minnesota on Friday night, February 4th, in which a caravan of vehicles blocked traffic. Now, a graphic and brief video, uh, body camera video of the raid involving a mirror lock released by the Minneapolis Police Department on Thursday, February 3rd, uh, Thursday night, shows an officer quietly turning a key in the uh, apartment door before officers enter the apartment and begin to shoot. Police search warrant, they yell. One officer kicked um, the back of the couch where Amir Locke was huddled under a blanket, jarring Amir, who appeared to be asleep, and making a gun visible. He was a legal gun carrier, had a permit for the gun, had a permit to carry. Um, and the, the police fired at least three times in response. So when you watch the video, all this transpires in about nine seconds. He didn't have time to respond, especially if you're asleep and you're trying to figure out what's going on and somebody just busts into the apartment, you're naturally going to grab your gun. But when you on uh, on NBC News, and I'm going to try to get a still photo of it, uh, on NBC News Today and also on... Um, uh, your Deet Tawode show um, making the case on the Black News Channel. They pointed out that when you look at the still photo, Amir's holding the gun, his finger is on the barrel of the gun. His finger's not even on the trigger. His finger's on the barrel of the gun. Because when you go through gun training, they teach you, you don't put your finger on the trigger until you're going to shoot, until you're ready to shoot. His finger wasn't even on the trigger. It was on the barrel of the gun. And you can see that. They show the picture. And you see the angle. You can You can see that. So uh, we're coming up here on a break. I want to go to this second clip. So the second clip, Shakita, is in this article. Now, uh, we're going to talk about Judge Cahill in uh, just a minute. But CBS uh, Local Minnesota has a good has a good article that uh, gives some more insight into this case, because there's still questions that we need to know that there's still answers we need to know and she killed Brewster for MSNBC talked about that in the clip that we just uh that we just shared Th this is a good article here from CBS Minnesota Channel 4 Amir Locke fatal shooting by MPD Minneapolis Police Department what we know and don't know so far what we know and don't know so far um okay we're coming up on a break. When we come back from the break, Shakita, uh, we're going to that video that's in that article from CBS Minnesota. Uh, so this, check out this article here, everybody. Uh, what we know, hold on, where is this? Um, a mirror lock fatal shooting by MPD, what we know and what we don't know. And uh, it talks about here in the days following a Minneapolis uh, police officer fatally shooting Amir Locke, 
uh, body camera footage has been released and the family has publicly condemned the shooting. Uh, there are plenty of unknowns still remaining. There are plenty of unknowns still remaining. So then they break down. Now, this this article is from February 7th. This article is from Monday, February 7th, 2022. We're going to go through and look at what we know and what we don't know. OK, you listen to the African History Network show on Michael M. Hotel. We'll be back in a few minutes. Jeanette Davis is a well-established author with six published books. Black Survival in White America from Past History to the Next Century was published in 1995, and it delves into the history of African Americans before slavery up to contemporary times. The Great Divide Between Blacks and Whites was released in 2008, and her autobiography, Black Just Like My Mama, was published in 2010. Soulful Journey, The Business of Beings, was released in December 2021, and her two latest books, Echoes from the Heart, Love Throws Poetry, and Master Being Human, were both published in January of 2022. Jeanette Davis' writings delve deeply into the psyche of black people from ancient to contemporary times. She cuts no corners and leaves no stones unturned in relating truth, letting the chips fall where they may on both African and European doorsteps. Order Jeanette Davis's books today at Amazon.com. Search for Jeanette Davis and get to know her work today. STEM Forward, helping our community find their place in the emerging fields of science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Join us for our monthly live stream on our website, stemforwardedu.org. Watch, subscribe, share. Also join our mailing list to stay up to date with STEM resources and opportunities. STEM Forward, the future is now. Watch, subscribe, share. On the African History Network show, we deal with current events in history and politics, education, economic empowerment, entrepreneurship, relationships, love, sex, health issues, and much, much more. Unfortunately, many people confuse what racism means. Racism is a power structure. It was laws and policies that put us in this predicament. It's going to be laws and policies that take us out. You control the radius of a man or woman's thoughts. You control the compass of his or her actions because the mind can't do what teach what it doesn't know. We have it all on 910 AM Superstation. 910, the Superstation, Detroit's only African American talk radio. Welcome back to the African History Network show, right here on 910 AM, the Superstation, the Future Radio. Call the numbers 313 778 7600. 313 778 7600 is the call in number if you have a question or comment. Okay, so uh, right before the break, we were looking at this. Uh, article here from CBS Minnesota Channel 4. Um, I want to go back to this here. Let's see here. CBS uh, Minnesota Channel 4. And this deals with what we know and what we don't know so far in the police killing of Amir Locke, who was legally armed, was not the suspect of the search warrant. Amir Locke, fatally shoot, uh, Amir Locke fatal shooting by MPD, Minneapolis Police Department what we know and don't know so far. Okay, this is from uh, Monday, February 7th, um, 2022. Let me close this out. And if we look at this here quickly, um, so nine seconds into the entry, uh, police said officers encountered a man armed with a handgun that was pointed in the direction of officers. This is what they're saying, pointing in the direction of officers. Then an officer identified as Mark Hanneman fired shots um, and uh, and Amir Locke was struck. He was treated at the scene and transported to uh, Hennepin, Hennepin Healthcare. OK, now. Um, uh, let, let's go to this clip here in uh, this article, uh, Shakita. This is from um, uh, CBS uh, Minnesota local channel four. Number of developments today in the deadly police shooting of Amir Locke. Defended using most no knock warrants while national experts review. Who was killed Wednesday as a SWAT team served a search warrant in a downtown Minneapolis apartment. 
Last night shows officers using a key to enter the apartment, loudly identifying themselves and kicking a sofa where Locke was under a blank. Locke's hand and police fire three shots. The city's interim is not named in the search warrant. Locke's family spoke to. Hey, Shakita, stop the clip. I believe it, it, it's, it, it's Shakita, just stop the clip. Execute. Just stop the clip. It's, it's freezing I, up. Just refresh it. Refresh that screen and just start it up when it's when when it, when it's uh, queued back up. Just refresh the screen. Start it up when it's queued back up. Okay, let me let me go back to this article here while we uh, get that uh, get that clip straightened out for you. So, and uh, I'm trying to get past this clip. Trying to I'm gonna appear on the screen. Um, If we go back to this here quickly, and then I want to go to this piece here dealing with Judge Cahill, who apparently was the judge who signed the uh, search warrant. Okay, stand by. Hold on. This is freezing up on me. Okay, here we go. We're back again. All right, let me look at this here. Okay, so uh, this article goes through, talks about the body worn camera footage, uh, medical examiner report as well, and uh, search warrant. Sources tell WCCO TV that many that Minneapolis police. We're following a number of developments today in the deadly police, police shooting of Amir Locke. Lock. In the last half hour, Minneapolis has been using. Music- most no knock warrants while national experts review the city's policy. Locke was killed Wednesday as a SWAT team served a search warrant in a downtown Minneapolis apartment. Body camera video released last night shows officers using a key to enter the apartment, loudly identifying themselves and kicking a sofa where Locke was under a blanket. A gun can be seen in Locke's hand and police fire three shots. The city's interim police chief has acknowledged that Locke was not named in the search warrant. Locke's family spoke today. The music. Just let I believe play. that he was executed by the MPD, and I want the police officer that murdered the my son police shooting up a mayor to lock. be In the last prosecuted. half hour, Minneapolis Lawrence, while national experts review the city's policy, Locke was search warrant in a downtown Minneapolis apartment. Body camera officers using a key to enter the apartment. Lolly Sofa where Locke was under a blanket. A gun can be seen in Locke. Three shots. The city's interim police chief has acknowledged that Locke. Locke's family spoke today. That he was executed by the MPD. And I want the police officer that murdered my son yes. to be prosecuted yes. and fired. Yes. A chair of the lock, a lawful gun owner, should still be alive, adding black men, like all citizens, have a right to keep. Tim Wall says that Minnesota made strides last year, passing statewide restrictions on the use of no-knock warrants, but they illustrate the need for further reform. On CBI. Okay, just stop the clip there. All right, that that clip is in here. Uh, We're going to try to find that on YouTube, see if we can play that on tomorrow's show. Uh, That clip is in this article here from uh, CBS Local Minnesota. All right, if we look at this, uh, go back to this, look at it quickly again. I want to go to the part where it talks about the search warrant. Okay, Um, it has a piece here where it deals with the search warrant and... All right, if we can get this video out of here. So this deals with what we know and what we don't know so far. And if we go down to the uh, part where it talks about the search warrant. Right here, search warrants. Okay. Um. 
see. Okay, sources tell WCO, um, sources tell WCCO TV that Minneapolis police would not serve the search warrant that ended uh, in the death of Amir Locke unless it was a no-knock warrant, and unless it was a no-knock warrant. Now, St. Paul police originally asked for um, a no-knock, uh, St. Paul police originally asked for a knock and announce warrant. St. Paul police originally asked for a knock and announce warrant, but only went back to get the the no knock warrant after Minneapolis police said they would not serve the first one. The sources said now on Friday, St. Paul police also confirmed that the search warrants in the incident were signed by a Hennepin County judge and will remain sealed until a court determines otherwise as is standard practice in homicide investigations and per Minnesota law. Now, two WCCO TV sources later confirmed that it was Judge Peter Cahill, the judge who presided over the Derek Chauvin trial, who signed off on the no-knock search warrant. What was released Friday, February 4th, however, was the search warrant requested by the Minnesota Bureau of Criminal Apprehension following the fatal shooting. It shows what evidence the BCA requested and obtained inside the downtown apartment as part of the BCA's investigation into the shooting. Now, among the property and items requested were forensic, uh, were forensic evidence, uh, trace or microscopic uh, permission to fully document the scene, clothing, firearms, and ammunition. Okay, so um, let me see if we can go back. I hate all these damn ads. I really do. Um, to read the rest of this here, a mere lot. This is from CBS Local, um, uh, CBS Local Minnesota Channel Four. A mere a mere lock fatal shooting by MPD Minneapolis Police Department what we know and don't know so far. Okay, so if we go to this piece here from um, NBC News, this story came out today. Chauvin trial judge likely signed warrant that led to fatal shooting of Amir Locke. Okay, we're going to clip three when we come back from the break, Shakita from uh, Roland Martin and Filter when I was on Roland Martin and Filter on Friday. Judge Peter Cahill was the signing judge last week, which means he would have reviewed and signed off on applications for search warrants. A court spokes, uh, a court spokesman said, now we all remember Judge Peter Cahill because the Derek Chauvin murder trial was televised. The Minneapolis judge who presided over the Derek Chauvin, uh, over Derek Chauvin state murder trial was on duty when the warrant was signed that led to the fatal shooting of Amir Locke last Wednesday, February 2nd. Judge Peter Cahill was the last signing judge last week. Well, Judge Peter Cahill was the signing judge last week, which means that he would have reviewed and signed off on applications for search warrants, a spokesman for the Hennepin County District Court said in a statement. We'll continue this on the other side of the break. We'll also talk about Brian Flores suing the NFL. You listen to the African History Network show. I'm Michael M. Hotel. We'll be back in a few minutes. The work that I do is larger than the fashion industry. It's larger than the art world. And I believe that I was born to bring newness into this world. I'm Kaima McIntyre. I'm 24 years old and I'm an artist. I create everything from paintings to jewelry design, metaphysical jewelry to be specific, and fashion design. The only reason why my prom dress went viral is because people needed it. Within a few days of going viral, Notori Naughton reached out to me and she's like, I saw your dress, can you make me a dress? I was equally as shocked to be asked by a celebrity to design their dress at the age of 17. 
that's just one person and the list just continues to go on to Janet Jackson, to Tyra Banks. It really hits home. That means that the discussion is happening on the grounds in real time. iRedify is a black-owned digital platform that showcases black and brown cultures and people. The books on the platform are written by African-American authors, Afro-Caribbean authors, African authors, and so much more. Kids 14 and under can read ebooks, listen to audiobooks, and complete learning activities. Kids can even write in the books digitally. Get unlimited access to everything on the platform for only $8.99 a month at iRedify.com. Sign up for your membership today. Welcome back to the African History Network show right here on 9, 10 a.m. Superstation Future Radio. I'm your host, Brother Michael M. Hotep. It is Monday, February 7th, 2022, and we are live. All right, be sure to uh, visit our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. Be sure to register for the online classes I teach on Saturdays and Sundays, the online history classes. On Sundays is Ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, Understanding the Transatlantic Slave Trade, where they didn't teach you in school. This is a 10-week online class that I teach. We deal with thousands of years of history and what leads up to the transatlantic slave trade taking place. Uh, we do this on Saturdays, 2 p.m. to 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Next class is Saturday, February 12th. We do the sessions live. All the sessions are archived and recorded. You can go back and watch. OK, so this class is on sale. $80, regularly $130. Uh, we have a bundle pack where you can uh, register for both classes for only $120. And the second class I teach on Sundays, 2 p.m. to 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Next class, Sunday, February 13th, is from the Civil War to the Civil Rights Movement and Black Power, 1865 to 1968. You can watch these classes. Uh, we do them live. All the sessions are archived and recorded, so you can go back and watch them on demand. Visit our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. If you've taken any of uh, the online classes with me before, and I've been teaching them since 2017, um, email us at ahn show at com, and you'll get 50% uh, off uh, the bundle pack. Okay. You'll get 50% off this uh, new bundle and these new classes. All right. I want to go back to. Um, this story here dealing with the mirror lock. So we were looking at this right before the break. Uh, we're going to clip three in just a second, Shakita. Uh, Chauvin trial judge likely signed warrant that led to fatal shooting of a mirror lock. Now, when um, on Friday, I was on Roland Martin Unfiltered, and we talked, uh, Roland spoke with the uh, mother of a mirror lock, uh, Karen Wales, and also the attorney. And we discussed it on the panel and we talked about the National Rifle Association. Let's go to clip number three, Shakita. Okay, take it off mute. This is what the NRA posted nine hours ago. Let crim Dear Joe Biden, let criminals walk. Same criminals commit more crimes. Come on, man. A team charged with shooting an NYPD cop. <laughs> then they had, oh, then they had to retweet from the NRA women mm -hmm. a tweet honoring Ida B. Wells Barnett. Oh, but let me help y'all out. The NRA says she was an educator, journalist, and civil rights crusader. She was also an advocate of the use of firearms for self-defense. She was an advocate for our firearms of self-defense because black folks were getting lynched. Exactly. Exactly. And I don't see a damn thing from the NRA. Go back. Nothing. Nothing. Saying doggone shame what happened to a law-abiding Second Amendment rights carry nothing. I see nothing about a mere lock. And they and they probably won't say anything about a mere lock. This is one of the bullet points, one of the questions I have here on my notes. Where are the Second Amendment people? Where's the NRA? Look how long it took the NRA to put out a statement when it came to uh, Philando Castile, who had a concealed pistol license, who was legally carrying. And when you study the uh, concealed pistol 
license laws in the state of uh, Minnesota where he was killed, he went above and beyond because based upon the state of Minnesota, if you have a, a, a CPL and you have your gun on you, you're not obligated to tell the police that you have your gun on you. He went above and beyond it, uh, above and beyond and told Officer Yan as he had his off his piece on him, his uh, pistol on him. So, uh, you know, I, I looked at this as well. I looked at the reporting from uh, NBC News and looked at the uh, footage. This looks like an execution, number one. Number two, then this calls into question, Roland. Okay, so uh, one of the first things I noticed is that they use the key to enter into the apartment, okay? And when you and and the um, reporting said that the officers chose to use a key. So I, I, I just, I'm just wondering, okay, so why did they choose to use a key to enter, number one? Number two, um, it's clear that Amir was under a blanket, probably asleep. He has a gun. Now, how are officers supposed to execute search warrants when they enter somebody's home and you have people who are legally owning guns because they don't know what's going on. You, you break in and the first thing somebody is going to do is grab that gun. Okay. So, uh, and, and the other thing is, is that, um, what, it's not clear that Amir was ordered to drop the gun. Now you heard one officer say, show me your hands, but it's not clear he was ordered to drop the gun, which once again is really problematic in the fault of the police as well. So this is this is a deep case. But I wonder when are the Second Amendment people and the NRA going to uh, stop voicing their opinions? And then when you ask where the, where the white people who were protesting for George Floyd, uh, we can ask where the white women who are out there protesting for George Floyd, because you, you should be talking about the voting rights bill, the voting rights act, because that impacts you and your women's reproductive rights also. Kelly, again. Okay, okay, pause right there. This is the fundamental problem. Okay. All right, that was from Friday, uh, February 4th, Roller Martin Unfiltered. Uh, Read this article here from NBC News. Now, they have uh, the still photo here now. I don't think they had it before. They have the still photo, and you see Amir's uh, finger, his index finger, is on the barrel of the gun. It's a semi automatic handgun his 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 index finger is not on the trigger he's in a sheet he was sleeping apparently sleeping legal gun owner permit to carry his his index finger is not on the trigger it's outside the trigger on the barrel of the gun because when you go through firearms training they tell you don't put your finger on the trigger unless you're going to shoot and he was shot three times All right, those watching on Facebook and YouTube, uh, keep watching. So, so once again, name of that article uh, from uh, NBC News this is one of the first ones here, and I think they've updated it. Uh, this is it. Also has the video of uh, the the press conference that was held uh, with the mayor and the acting police chief as well, and the um, the uh, sister, the activist, she was on, I forgot her name. Uh, I think it's Nakima, Nakima Levy Armstrong. You see her right here. She called out the mayor uh, as well as the acting police chief on their sugar honey iced tea. She called him out. Watch this video. Oh, she told her behinds up. She was on, Roland spoke with her on Friday as well. So this article is from February 4th, 2022. It was updated. Minneapolis police released body camera footage of fatal shooting a black man 22 during no knock warrant okay those watching on facebook and youtube keep watching um we're going to get to uh quickly the story here with brian flores uh suing the nfl he was interviewed on politics nation uh this past saturday by reverend al sharpen so it's a recent interview i want to go to that we talked about this last week uh last week on the show also i shared the interview he did on all in with chris hayes um on msnbc if you like this type of information you can support the african history network dollar sign the ahn show through cash app dollar sign the ahn show through cash app also through paypal paypal.me 
sports slash the AHN show. So we're here six days a week. This helps us keep doing the research, stay on the air, keep broadcasting. This is our official cash app account, dollar sign, the AHN show, S-H-O-W. When you go to it, it says Michael and, show my, and shows my picture here. These other ones are fake African History Network cash app accounts. Those are not me. A cash app tags right here on the homepage of our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. We also have the uh, uh, yellow button, a uh, yellow donate button for uh, PayPal. And then you can register for the online history classes I teach on Saturdays and Sundays. Uh, also, ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school. And from the Civil War to the Civil Rights Movement and Black Power, 1865 to 1968. All right, be sure to listen to the audio podcast of these shows, wherever you get your podcast from, and download the iHeartRadio app, search for the African History Network show. You can listen to podcasts there as well. Uh, right now, it's correct wrong behavior. It's not over till we win. We're kind of forever. We'll talk to you tomorrow. Peace. Stand by. Stand by. Okay, let me go to this next story here with Brian Flores. So I noticed that uh, it's been announced that some uh, more African-American coaches are going to be hired by the NFL and um, a biracial coach, uh, uh, one who identifies as biracial. So uh, we're going to go to this story here then with Brian Flores. Now, African-American head coaches is good but i'm more concerned about ownership i'm more concerned i'm more concerned about african americans owning teams because if you own the team you can hire whoever the hell you want to hire i'm more concerned about ownership of teams 32 teams none owned by african americans and we're uh set about 68 70 percent of the league now i saw one report that said in 2021 we were 58 percent of the league but we're still the majority but no uh don't own any of the teams so this is about ownership so there was a good article from uh new york times how's everybody doing share this broadcasting on social media platforms give us a thumbs up if you like this or a heart uh turn on live notifications so you know when we go live also when we broadcast uh, I want to go to this uh, piece here from New York Times. Uh, Brian Flores sues NFL claiming bias in coaching search. And I want to go to the uh, a good interview from Politics Nation on Saturday, February 5th. So I have to cue that up. Brian Flores sues NFL claiming bias in coaching search. The former head of the Miami Dolphins, former head coach of the Miami Dolphins, in a class action lawsuit um, filed Tuesday, uh, claims that the NFL discriminated against him and other black coaches in their hiring process in, in their hiring practices. Okay. Uh, Brian Flores, who was fired as coach of the Miami Dolphins last month, was rejected for new jobs with other clubs, has sued the NFL and his 32 teams, alleging that they discriminated against him and other black coaches in their hiring practices. Now, I want to cue this up here. OK, that's the one with Chris Hayes. Where's the one? This is the one I want here. Just say, let me cue this clip up. Okay, so all right, stand by. This week's news from the world of pro football. As the number of black head coaches who survived this current NFL season 
with their jobs intact has dropped down to just one, drawing criticism from black fans. As one black former head coach addressed his own grievances against the league with a potentially historic lawsuit. He joins me now, former NFL head coach Brian Flores and his attorney, uh, John Eleftorakis. Uh, Eleftorakis, yes. Eleftorakis. I always get your name wrong, John, as long as I know <laughs> it's you. It's okay, Rev. You, thank you uh, both for joining us here tonight. Uh, and and uh, certainly we appreciate you coming in live. I have to start with some added context for our audience who might not follow football. This week, you filed a federal suit against the NFL, contending that in addition to a pattern of racial discrimination across the league, you say in the lawsuit that your most recent employer, the Miami Dolphins, asked you to intentionally lose games against your will, while two others, the New York Giants and Denver Broncos, effectively used their interviews with you to check a box on diversity, manipulating the NFL's own rules to close the gap. In a league that's still about 60 to 70 percent black as far as players, but has never had more than 20 percent black head coaches. And we're now down just to one in 32 teams. Of course, we have to point out that the NFL uh, uh, land those three organizations have issued statements denying your claims, insisting on good faith. Make your case, Coach Flores. Why? It, it's clearly uh, when you turned the whole team around, a losing team got fired. You're doing interviews for other jobs. Why would you put your career on the line? Well, I would say Senator Padilla just said it um, just a few minutes ago. Representation matters. Uh, and there's just a lack of representation um, for black and minority uh, coaches and uh, executives and just representation and leadership positions as a whole in the National Football League. And um that's got to change. This 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 lawsuit isn't about me. Um, it's about um, that lack of representation. It's about the people and the generations that are going to come behind me. Um, and it's about the young 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 people, um, young young boys and girls like my my kids. I've got three young kids that are uh, nine, eight, and five. Um, they're they're not limited to just being players in the National Football League or an NBA. They can be coaches. They can be executives. Uh, they can be owners. Um, but but you know. As it sits right now, there's, there's no examples of that. You know, uh, uh, John, uh, as attorney, let, let's go on the record. The Miami Dolphins claimed that the firing was because of organization issues. Uh, owner Stephen Ross said in part, quote, an organization can only function if it's collaborative and it works well together. He also denied that they paid the coach money to lose games. The New York Giants told NBC News in part, quote, the fact of the matter is Brian Flores was in the conversation to be our head coach until the 11th hour. Ultimately, we hired the individual we felt most qualified to be our next coach. The Denver Broncos say those allegations are, quote, blatantly false and that their process was thorough and fair to determine the most qualified candidate. And the NFL released a memo today that went to all 32 teams titled Our Commitment to Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, saying in parts that the results of the NFL coaching diversity efforts, quote, are unacceptable, and stating that, quote, racism and, and any form of discrimination is contrary to NFL values, and adding that, quote, we understand the concerns of Flores and others this week. Uh, attorney, I mean, the facts are the facts. 32 teams, one black coach, no black owners, never was a black owner. And Flores is doing interviews for other jobs. He certainly didn't have to do this. So, I mean, when do they stop thinking they can just buy chicken dinners to uh, uh, groups and throwing money at, at uh, so-called social justice groups that don't fight social justice and deal with the systemic problem in their league? Well, Rev... Now they're forced to deal with it because Coach Flores lent himself, his career, to this cause. And, you know, you hear different statements from the various organizations and even from the league, but the numbers speak for themselves. And, you know, this this situation is not limited to Coach Flores. This is, this is a situation that every black minority candidate, whether for coaching, uh, executive positions, they experience this all the time. And Rev... As you know, as you're a champion for these causes, this is not just limited to the NFL. Right. You know, the, the issue is that 
our country really goes and takes takes leadership from from sports, especially the NFL. So how you know we have to really fight against the NFL, the racist policies, and we have to stand up and we're doing that in this lawsuit and saying it's not going to happen anymore. These window dressing statements of a commitment to diversity are not enough. Especially when you don't see it. You know, Coach Flores, this being Politics Nation, I was interested to read that the same week the Washington franchise finally settling on a name, several former employees of that organization, especially women, testified before a Congressional Oversight Committee, alleging a pattern of abuse and sexual misconduct involving senior lead, uh, leadership. Some players and the team's owner, Daniel Snyder, in an email statement from the team, Snyder apologized again for past misconduct that took place in his organization but denied the new allegations. And I'm not asking you to comment directly on those allegations, but I would be interested to hear you if you think the league is due for a wide investigation by federal authorities. Because watching from afar, it seems like the culture of the organization is continually exposed as being toxic. But the money keeps rolling in, so it's tolerated. I mean, would you testify in front of a congressional committee about what's going on in terms of racial uh, discrimination. You know, let, let, let me jump in first because <laughs> I don't know if we've committed him to testifying or we, that's something we'll discuss with our legal team and my co-counsel Douglas Wigder. But the reality is Congress needs to step in and conduct hearings. That's okay. not, that's not a secret. Ten years ago, we conducted hearings on steroids in baseball. So when the NFL is discriminating against black minority candidates in executive and upper management positions, is that not worth Congress's time? Absolutely. Well, I'm not going to ask you, are you going to testify? Will you testify? What I'll say, let me just, what I, what I'll say right, right. is what we do need is change. That's, that's, we know that. And I think this lawsuit, this is, this is, uh, this is going to be the vehicle for change. And we need, we need as many people to get behind this lawsuit uh, to support, you know, what we're doing. Because um, it's a class action suit. It's a class action suit. Um, and look, my story is not the only one. Um, uh, of its kind around the National Football League, from from, from black coaches, minorities, uh, women in the NFL. Um, I, I don't stand alone here, but it's hard to uh, step out against uh, uh, the National Football League for a lot of reasons. Number one being, we love to coach. I love to coach, and uh, you're putting that in jeopardy when you when you when you uh, challenge the National Football League. But in but 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 it's 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 bigger than. Um, it's bigger than football. It's bigger than me. And this isn't about me at all. This is about well, clearly it's not about you. You're risking <laughs> your coaching career. You know, uh, uh, on the field protest uh, moment popularized by Colin Kaepernick and Eric Reed and others is now six years old. And the league is still dealing with the optics and the fallout from that moment. I thought about that in preparing for this interview, reading some of the numbers from the University of Central Florida's Institute in Diversity uh, and ethics in sport, which found a nearly 12% drop in the number of self-identified black pay players in the NFL from nearly 70% in 2016 to about 58% last year. H have you gotten any sense that black athletes are turning away from the league now, popular as it remains? Uh, I can't speak to those numbers. I know uh, the players that I'm around, um, they love to play, they love to practice, they love to prepare. And I love to coach them. So I, I really can't speak to those numbers. Let me, let me, when you say you love to coach them and you turn literally a team around and we all have heard about how, uh, you mistakenly got a, uh, uh, a text, uh, that w was intended for a white name, Brian, saying, Brian, congratulations. Yeah. And this was for getting a coach job that you were getting ready to interview for. You thought he was congratulating you, telling you in advance you were getting the job and it wasn't that. I mean, when you read that, when you see the the systemic elimination of people that have excelled like you have, how does it make you feel personally? Uh, I, I, there's a wave of emotions. I think that that, that uh, text message confirmed a lot of the things that um, you know uh, black coaches and, and minorities in, 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 in the National Football League uh, felt like were happening in back rooms and. Uh, uh, you know, backroom conversations, and uh, it just confirmed that. Um, and that's a, you know, I'm, I'm, that was really the day I felt like, you know, we couldn't be silent anymore. Um, there comes a time where silence is betrayal, and, and, and you know, Dr. King said that. Um, we can't stay silent on these, these issues anymore. 
You know, uh, one of the things that struck me, John, about uh, uh, the coach here is that he comes from Brownsville. <laughs> and I grew up in Brownsville, a little before him. Never ran, uh, never will. Never ran, never will. <laughs> so he comes from a tough neighborhood, and, and I grew up there, and it's tough. But he, his mother, who uh, you said used to watch me doing oh, yeah. rallies and stuff, oh, yeah. his mother and them fought to get him in a good prep school in Brooklyn that you went to, and my daughters went to. I didn't even know my daughters knew the coach until this happened. And you made it. I mean, you broke out of Brownsville, made something of yourself, a role model to people that they can break out. And then you treated like this. I don't know if they know how tough you are, because if you had to come off of Amboy Street and Livonia and, and, and where we came from, you know, we can take a lot. But I think the fact that you got out and didn't say, I'm out, I'm going to protect mine, is something that I really admire about you. Thank you. I mean... Um, you know, I think you, you mentioned my mom and she passed away three years ago. Um, she, she, she was, uh, adamant about, um, us giving back to the community, community and not forgetting where we came from. Um, and that's a big part of why, why, um, you know, we filed the lawsuit because it's not about me. It's about, you know, those who come behind me. Um, I spoke to a, 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 a team yesterday, um, uh, and talk to them about, you know, this sacrifice is for them. Um, and, and I believe that. John, uh, in the coming days, I hope some of the celebrities and others come out and support. And uh, this being a class action suit, I'm sure knowing you the way you work, uh, there'll be other announcements of others joining on. Are you concerned that the NFL will attempt to derail the suit through arbitration before it ever goes to court? There's no derail in this train, Rev. You know, one of the things that the NFL may try to do is move the case to arbitration, which, quite frankly, if they are sending out statements saying they're committed to diversity, why would they? And, and you should watch for this as you follow the lawsuit. Are they going to try to move this litigation from a jury in the public view to behind closed doors. Because then the question needs to be asked, how committed are you to diversity if you're continuing to try to take these very real issues that where the numbers don't lie and sweep them under the rug behind closed doors? So if their legal team tries to take that approach, that's telling about their so-called commitment. And that's one of the reasons I, as president of the National Action Network, the president of the Urban League, National Urban League, president of the ACP, all of us wrote uh, to uh, the commissioner and, and said we need a real meeting to sit down and deal with the details of this lawsuit and why we support it. These are major civil rights organizations. Not going and getting guys that they make activists, but people that have a solid record in that. And that are not looking for anything other than to see justice around this lawsuit, which helps everybody else. And I think that's the important thing here. And if they cannot deal with civil rights groups or deal with the public, uh, then I think that tells us a lot. And let's not forget, many of those stadiums are built mm -hmm. by investments from municipal, state, and uh, taxpayers. Mm -hmm. So even if you're not a football player, we are paying for stadiums that our kids can't be coaches mm -hmm. and our kids can't uh, own the team. So uh, we may be going to some city councils with some Flores legislation. Yeah. You didn't say that I did. <laughs> Thank you both for coming Thank in for and being here. All right. <laughs> but he's right. A lot of those stadiums were built uh, with taxpayer dollars from city council and built in, uh, and here you have 32 teams, no African-American owners. And the league is between 58% and 68% African-American. So the numbers here, I was looking at this before, and Joanne, Joanne Reed talked about this as well. 2021, it, it appears the numbers dipped in the NFL of um, uh, black players. But still, it's still a majority, okay? even at 58%. So 2016, uh, now the source of this is the Institute for Diversity and Ethics in Sport. 2016, the percentage of African-American players in the NFL was 69.7%. And in uh, 2021, 
it's uh, 58%, okay, according to these numbers here. But 58% is still a majority. Now, what's interesting is if you've been paying attention to this, and uh, they talked about this on the uh, Black News Channel today. I, uh, I want to go to this. I, post, I just posted this on my Facebook page, my personal page, Michael M. Hotep. So we got the news, and I, I posted the article that um, – uh, OK, so uh, NFL coaching front office moves since Friday, since Friday, February 4th, Baltimore Ravens hire Sashi Brown as team president. Saturday, February 5th, New York Giants hire Brandon Brown as assistant general manager. Sunday, Miami Dolphins hire Mike McDaniel as head coach. Now, I, I posted an article uh, about Mike, Mad Mike McDaniel being hired. It was I got a breaking news alert when he was hired. Um, when that story came out, and I was watching the Black News Channel the day they talked about it. He said he he identifies as biracial. My I got a breaking news alert from the Miami Herald. That's what happened. I monitor about thirty five different news sources on a daily basis, so um, I get breaking news alerts all throughout the day and sometimes the night. Usually the night two, I get alerts. This article here from the Miami Herald. Um, Miami Dolphins hire 49ers offensive coordinator Mike McDaniel to be next head coach. Okay, so uh, this is from February 6th, updated February 6, 2022. And uh, they talk about here, and I think it's here in the article, they say he identifies as biracial. Uh, the Dolphins have hired San Francisco 49ers offensive coordinator Mike McDaniel as their next head coach. And uh, McDaniel, he's 38 years old, becomes 11th head coach in Dolphins history and the fourth hired since uh, Stephen, Stephen Ross became majority order owner in 2009. And it is, okay, all this stuff out. All right. I think I already sent, I think I already have a subscription to Miami Herald. I need to, um, I guess I got a subscription to the Miami Herald back when, uh, uh, president Jovenel Moise was killed, uh, Haiti president. So yeah, I have to log in here cause I pay the money, but it is, let me see something here. Okay. McDaniel, who was biracial, his father is black. Uh, becomes the first minority hired in this year's coaching cycle. So, so you have this taking taking place now. Once again, is I want to go back to this here uh, from the Black News Channel. It's good to have African American head coaches, but I'm more concerned about ownership. It's good to have African Americans in the front office. And assistant general managers and general managers, but they can be fired by the owner. I'm more concerned about ownership because when you own a team, you don't have to get permission to hire people. You can hire whoever you want to hire as coach. You know, so I'm more concerned about ownership. And the 32 team owners, the team owners vote when it comes to somebody becoming an owner of a team. So Saturday, New York Giants hire Brandon Brown as assistant general manager. Sunday, Miami Dolphins hire Mike McDaniel as head coach. Also on Sunday, New Orleans uh, Saints interview New Orleans Saints interview uh, Eric Bien, Bien, uh, Bien Emmy. And Sunday, Lovey Smith used to coach uh, Chicago Bears. Lovey Smith reported uh, is reportedly a front runner to be the head coach for the Houston Texans. All right. So this has just come out since Friday. Since Friday, February 4th, all this has come out. But once again, 
we need to we need to we need to focus on ownership is 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 the the lawsuit should go forward and they're going to be others that join the lawsuit it's a class action lawsuit okay but the most important thing to me to focus on is ownership because if you own a team you can hire whoever you want to uh, uh roger goodell put out a statement um Roger Goodell put out a statement and okay. So th this is an example of what happens when you come here and post and don't know what the hell you're talking about. Um, obviously you got somebody that, that, that doesn't do research and, and doesn't come here very often. And this is, uh, a different show than probably what you're used to. So w w what you should do is read this, do some research and come back and talk to me because obviously you have no clue what you're talking about. Who's that, Don? How you doing, Don? Progress of the African-American community during the Obama administration. I've dealt with this numerous times before. People don't do research. You know, the U.S. prison population dropped to its lowest point in December uh, 2016 under President Obama. And the, and, and, and the uh, criminal justice reforms that were made under the Obama administration were reversed under the Trump administration, many of them. So this goes through, this is at whitehouse.gov. People don't do research. This goes through and breaks down category by category how the policies from the Obama administration were beneficial to the African-American community. Unfortunately, a lot of this stuff got attacked and reversed or weakened under the Trump administration because we don't do research. We don't read. You go through and read this category by category. All right. So check out the rest of this here. I'm dealing with another topic right now. But once again, people don't do research. We'll post this link here. It's people don't understand how elections have consequences. So, and we've dealt with this numerous times here on this show. So I, I don't know. I don't know what people are getting their misinformation from. Um, and then here, this one here. See, there was a reason why a lot of police officers voted for Donald Trump. Because Trump said he was going to unleash the police. Trump said he was going to unleash the police. Uh, let me see here. This one. deals with Trump reversing the policies in the Justice Department. One of them, uh, Jeff Sessions did in, was it March 2017? When he, when uh, he reinstituted when he reinstituted um, going after the, the harshest, uh, longest sentences for nonviolent drug offenders because the Obama administration have reversed that. That was a smart on crime initiative from 2013 under Attorney General Eric Holder. Let me find this here. And then Firefox looking at this yeah this one right here uh okay this deals with housing desegregation trump rolls back obama housing desegregation rule see these are things that um uh, these are things that uh Ben Carson did. 
um this uh but troll though okay miss Brand said well i didn't call him a troll somebody else may call him a troll but i've got trolls in different area codes but um you can you can come in it's going this, this is like a roach motel you can come in but you ain't leaving read this article here from a politico.com trump moves to roll back obama housing desegregation rule trump the trump administration was devastating for the country and for african americans but the problem is people don't do research so they don't they don't notice they just uh they get i guess the information from social media memes and don't research the claims of social media memes okay so this is this is one article that gets into it it's not the main one i was looking for but this will put you on the right track because there's a lot of people on the wrong track and they just uh don't do research at all we're in the information age and i don't understand why people don't do research i really i really don't but okay trump says obama didn't reform policing but he did then the president ditched it trump reversed the police reforms that president obama and his administration is and his department of justice put in place A look at the false claim that the previous administration was nowhere on an issue roiling the nation then and now. now this is from January 16th, uh, June, sorry, June 16th, 2020. Donald Trump claimed Tuesday that his predecessor did not take action on reforming police, even though it was under Trump that several Obama era changes were scrapped. President Obama and Vice President Biden never even tried to fix this during their eight year period. The reason they didn't try is they had no idea how to do it. Trump lied in the White House Rose Garden before he signed an executive order that encourages police departments to adopt high standards like banning chokeholds unless the life of the officer is at risk and to create a, da a database of excessive force complaints. Remember, Donald Trump ran in 2016 on the platform of law and order and he ran as a backlash to the black lives matter movement and he said that police didn't need less th authority they needed more authority this is what he said on the campaign trail in 2016 but uh, but um president obama who confronted and addressed race and racism frequently did take action to reform uh police and try to reduce bias in law enforcement the Trump administration is well aware of that, too. It unraveled those changes. He said uh, he said President Obama did nothing on police reform, but the fact is they made a lot of progress and President Trump rolled it back, said Senate Minority Leader Chuck Schumer when he was Senate Minority Leader. In August of 2017, Trump reversed an Obama policy that banned the military from selling surplus equipment to police, a measure that had been put in place amid criticism over the armored vehicles, tear gas, and assault rifles used to control protests after the police killing of Michael Brown, 18 years old, in Ferguson, Missouri in 2014. In addition, in September 2017, the Justice Department said it would stop the Obama era practice of investigating police departments because there were uh, 24, 25 investigations into the patterns and practices of police departments. That was more than any previous administration. It's that's those investigations stopped under Trump. There was only one investigation under Trump. And not only that, when Jeff Sessions became Trump's um, when Jeff Sessions became Trump's first um Attorney General Jeff Sessions tried to back out of the consent decrees with the Baltimore Police Department and the Chicago Police Department that the Obama administration entered into. He tried to back out of those consent decrees, but a federal judge would not let him do it. Because they because the Trump administration took, took basically took a handoff approach to policing. 
especially Jeff Sessions as attorney general, who was totally against criminal justice reform, police reform. Jeff Sessions was totally against that. Uh, there was a, let me see. Okay, so there was uh, I can't find I can't find the other one, but all right, this is good enough here. The Justice Department said it would stop the Obama era practice of investigating police departments and issue and issuing police reports about their failings. For example, the Justice Par the Justice Department had investigated the Ferguson Police Department and found unconstitutional, unlawful, and racist behavior and policing within the department. Those reports were used to demand change in, in the good consent decrees, which are legal agreements between local police and the Justice Department mandating reforms enforceable by courts. When he served as Trump's attorney general, Jefferson Beauregard Sessions III made it clear early on that he opposed consent decrees like the one struck in Ferguson, and he ordered a review of the Justice Department's more than a dozen consent decrees. Jeff Sessions said they reduced morale of police. Okay, so read the rest of this here. Oh, that stuff got reversed under Trump. People, but people don't do research. They just go by social media memes. Uh, these dumbass people you watch on social media have absolutely no clue what they're talking about. Don't study politics. Just repeat a bunch of nonsense. So they can just get social media clicks or views or whatever the hell they're doing. Attorney General Jeff Sessions plans to roll back decades of police reform. Attorney General Jeff Sessions called for the review of existing or contemplated agreements between police departments and the federal government. Not to mention that um, under the Trump, Donald Trump renew, renewed the contracts for privatized prisons because the Obama administration said they were not going to renew the contracts for privatized prisons. And Core Civic and Geo Group, that are the two largest owners and operators of privatized prisons in the country. They donated almost six hundred thousand dollars to Donald Trump's uh, uh, 2016 campaign. And then when he became president through the Electoral College, he renewed their contracts. So a lot of people don't understand how elections have consequences. They just repeat a bunch of simple Simon ass nonsense. So this is this is a good place to come to with that. You're talking to somebody who actually knows what they're talking about. This is a good place to come to with that. All right, let's continue. Uh, read this piece here from, uh, actually, I want to go to this one here from uh, Yahoo News. Then with Roger Goodell. Roger Goodell sends memo addressing Brian Flores lawsuit. There is much work to do. Now, this is from Saturday, February 5th, 2022. Uh, the NFL quickly denied all charges when former Miami Dolphins coach Brian Flores sued the league Tuesday. But NFL commissioner Roger Goodell expressed a different opinion in the memo to teams on Saturday. So there was a there was a change from the initial statements to this statement to this memo that Roger Goodell released on Saturday, which was more in line with agreeing with uh, Brian Flores' lawsuit, or at least the need, or at least the foundation of the lawsuit, racism when it comes to hiring coaches, things like this. Roger Goodell addressed issues brought up in Brian Flores' lawsuit 
saying the league has done an unacceptable job in this diversity of head coaches. This is Roger Goodell, the league commissioner, saying this. This was the memo he put out on Saturday. Roger Goodell addressed issues brought up in Brian Flores' lawsuit, saying the league has done an unacceptable job in its diversity of head coaches. He stated there is much work to be done in the NFL. Roger Goodell's full statement read, and I don't think I'm going to read this whole statement. I want to address a subject that many of us have discussed together, not only this week, but consistently for many years. Racism and any form of discrimination is contrary to the NFL's values. We have made significant efforts to promote diversity and adopted numerous policies and programs which have produced positive change in many areas. However, we must acknowledge that particular, particularly with respect to head coaches, the results have been unacceptable. When it comes to head coaches, the results have been unacceptable. Also, when it comes to owners, if the, if the results have been unacceptable, when it comes to head coaches, then what are, what are the results when it comes to owners? There's never been an African-American owner of an NFL team. We reevaluate and examine all policies, guidelines, and initiatives relating to diversity, equity, and inclusion, including as they relate to gender. We are retaining outside experts to assist in this review and will also solicit input from current and former players and coaches, advocates, and other authorities in this area. Now, this is just stop for a minute, okay? Outside experts to assist in the review. Now, okay, but I... What type of expert do you need to say y'all a bunch of racist uh, uh, team owners? I mean, you don't need an expert to to figure that out. Now, the interesting thing about the NFL is that Roger Goodell works for the team owners. If the team the team owners could change all this overnight. The team, the team owners could change all this overnight. They just don't want to. So you can, you can bring in, you can bring in the experts, but they need to be called out and say, look, y'all can change this overnight. The, t the team owners can just get together. They can have a meeting at, at the country club or strip club, or whatever club. You just say, look, we're going to, change all this right now we are retaining outside experts to assist in this review and will also solicit input from current and former players and coaches advocates and other authorities in the area you're going to consult with colin kaepernick or you don't consider him an expert he is a former player you're going to consult with colin kaepernick you should consult with colin kaepernick now our goal is simple make our efforts and those of the clubs more effective so that real and tangible results will be achieved we understand the concerns expressed by coach flores and others this week while the legal process moves forward we will not wait to reassess and modify our strategies to ensure that they are consistent with our values and long-standing commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion. I don't know. Well, man. I don't know how long-standing these values are. See, there's a difference between the, 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 there's a difference between having the values and actually implementing the values, operating based upon the values. Okay, there's a difference between that. In particular, 
we recognize the need to understand the lived experiences of diverse members of the NFL family to ensure that everyone has access to opportunity and is treated with respect and dignity. We also take seriously any issue relating to the integrity of NFL games. These matters will be reviewed thoroughly and independently, thoroughly and independently. We expect that these independent experts will receive full cooperation from everyone associated with the league or any member of uh, or any member with the league or any member as this work proceeds. There is much to do, there's much work to do, and we will embrace this moment and seize the opportunity to become a stronger, more inclusive team. Now, I mean, that sounds good, Roger Goodell, but you still didn't say we need more, we need black owners of NFL teams. So that was his statement. Roger Goodell stated that the league will bring in outside experts to review the NFL's policies aimed at creating a more diverse league. The NFL will also receive input from, okay, blah, blah. Okay, but, okay. So read the rest of this here. That's all good, but talk to me when you want to talk about ownership, when you want to talk about ownership of teams. Because that's where the real money is and that's where the power is. Because when you own the when you own the team, you can hire whoever you want to hire. So read the rest of this here. Roger Goodell sends memo addressing Brian Flores' lawsuit. There is much more work to do. This is from Saturday, February fifth, twenty twenty two. All right, now Brian Flores uh, made the allegation about being encouraged to tank games. Which means lose games so that um, the team can get a higher draft pick in next season's draft. They have a losing season, so the team the team get a higher draft draft pick in next year's um, draft. Okay, so uh, uh, this article here from NBC News goes through uh, a lot of these uh, claims. A lot of these allegations that Brian Flores made sham interviews and mistaken Bill Belichick texts. six tech takeaways from Brian Flores lawsuit against the NFL. This is from um, February 2nd, 2022. I want to zoom in on one of them here. Read the rest of this. It's one or two I want to look at. Um, I think this is the last one, page seven. This one right here, Flores firing, Flores firing and allegations he was asked to tank the Dolphins. This is what Roger Goodell was talking about in um, his statement. Okay, so it's right here. Flores firing and allegations he was asked to tank the Dolphins. Flores' lawsuit also accuses the Dolphins of demanding that he loses games or tank. The pro sports strategy makes winning a low priority so payroll can be kept to a minimum while a team can be rewarded with high choices in the college draft that could lead to success in the future. The owner of the Dolphins, Stephen Ross, wanted Brian Flores to tank the season to put the team in a position to secure the first draft pick, secure the first draft pick, draft pick and offered him $100,000 for each game lost that year, Brian Flores lawsuit says. 
he says he was he, he said team owner Stephen Ross wanted him to tank games to tank the season to put the team in position to secure the first pick in the draft and Bri and Brian Flores alleges that Miami Dolphins team owner Stephen Ross offered him $100,000 for each game lost that year. Quote, when the Dolphins started winning games, doing no small part to Mr. Flores coaching, Mr. Flores, Brian Flores, was told by the team's general manager, Chris Greer, that, quote, Steve was mad, Steve was mad that Brian Flores' success in winning games that year was compromising the team's draft position, the lawsuit says. Because in the interview that Brian Flores did with Chris Hayes last week on MSNBC, he said, you know, he wasn't going to throw games. He coaches to win. He wasn't going to throw games. Stephen Ross also had asked Brian Flores in 2019 to recruit a prominent quarterback in violation of league tampering rules, which Brian Flores refused to do, the lawsuit says. Brian Flores was fired January 10th, 2022. Flores was labeled by the Dolphins brass as someone who was difficult to work with, the lawsuit says. Quote, this is reflective of an all too familiar, all too familiar angry black man stigma that is often casted upon African-American men who are strong in their morals and convictions while white men are coined as being passionate. If they do, the, if white men exhibit the same behavior, they are called passionate, dedicated, Things like this, African-American men do the same thing. They're called angry black men. Dolphins senior vice president and spokesman Jason Jenkins said on Tuesday, we vehemently, so this was last Tuesday, this was Tuesday, February 1st, quote, we vehemently deny any allegations of racial discrimination and are proud of the diversity and inclusion throughout our organization." The implication that we acted in a manner inconsistent with the integrity of the game is incorrect. So read the rest of this here. They also talk about um, uh, other African-American coaches joining the class action lawsuit. Other black coaches who have been passed over or quickly dismissed. Other black coaches who have been passed over or quickly dismissed. The suit lists six coaches it says were discriminated against within the NFL because they are black. Jim Caldwell, who was fired by the Detroit Lions and got the Lions their best, their best um, record since 1991. They were 11 and five and, and, and he was African-American and the Lions fired him. Got these old sorry ass coaches after him. And Steve Wilkes were fired despite their success with their teams. The lawsuit says Jim Caldwell took the Indianapolis coach to the Super Bowl his first year. It had a winning second year, but the team fell after its loss, a a after its, uh, after it lost its star quarterback, Peyton Manning. And despite his uh, success and the justifiable reasons for his poor record, in one season uh, out of three, Jim Caldwell was fired, the lawsuit says. Jim Caldwell was then hired by the sorry ass Detroit Lions and fired again, even though he had winning records in the majority of his seasons and got the Detroit Lions their, be their best record since 1991. They were He got them an 11 and five record. And they fired him and got some sorry ass white uh, coaches. There was a this one right here. 
Detroit Free Press. Let me close these ads out from the Detroit Free Press. Okay. Uh, read this article here. This goes into it. Agent, Detroit Lions conducted sham interview with Terrell Austin after Jim Caldwell firing February 3rd, 2022. Okay, this is Detroit Free Press written by Dave Burkett. 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 And they talk about in here, Jim Caldwell, franchise. Okay, Jim Caldwell, who's African-American, coached the Detroit Lions. Caldwell went 36 and 28 in four seasons with the Detroit Lions. He led the organization to two playoff appearances, including an 11 and five record in 2014, the franchise's best record since 1991. Jim Caldwell got the Lions an 11 and five record in 2014, the best record since 1991. But he was let go two years uh, after. He, but but was let go two years after the Lions fired general manager Martin uh, Mayhew and President Tom Lewan at midseason. So read the rest of this here from the Detroit Free Press. And then uh, read this piece here from uh, NBC News. Sham interviews and mistaken Bill Belichick texts. Six takeaways from Brian Flores' lawsuit against the NFL. This is something very courageous that Brian Flores is doing. Okay, this is something very courageous that Brian Flores is doing. And he ain't, he's not doing this for the money because he may never coach again in the NFL. He ain't doing this for the money. This is this this is this is a fight for to open up doors for other coaches, for future generations, for kids coming up now who are playing football in high school, kids in college who can be head coaches, general managers, but also the focus needs to be on team owners the focus needs to be on ownership because when you own a team you can hire whoever you want to and that's where the real money is in ownership yes they yes the coaches make millions of dollars but it's impossible it's, it's almost impossible to lose money owning an nfl team even the lion the lions went one and 16 one year the team was still worth something like a billion dollars because of the revenue sharing in the NFL. It's damn near impossible to lose money on an NFL team because of the way it's structured. So you can have a terrible team and still make money because I remember here, the, the team was so bad, people were protesting because they wanted the Ford family to sell the damn team. They didn't want to sell because it was still worth a billion even though it was a horrible team because of the revenue share. So we need to get that money. This, this is about ownership. All right. Okay, everybody follow us here on our Facebook fan page, The African History Network, The African History Network, and our YouTube channel, Michael M. Hotep, I-M-H-O-T-E-P. Uh, if you'd like this type of information, you support the African History Network, dollar sign the AHN show through Cash App, dollar sign the AHN show through Cash App, also through PayPal, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show. We're here six days a week. So this helps us keep doing the research, stay on the air, keep broadcasting, pay some of the bills. Because I'm because i on 9, 10 a.m. Superstation. I do radio. I don't get paid to do radio. They don't pay me to do the show. Okay, so this helps us keep doing the research stay on the air keep broadcasting we have the information here at our website this is our official cash app account dollar sign the ehn show s-h-o-w and uh you can also set it up for a recurring donation through uh paypal 
if you want to do it like every month. I think also through you can do it through Cash App. You can register for the online classes that I teach. Now, if you want me to do a presentation for your group organization, email me at ahnshow at africanhistorynetwork.com. African American business owners, post the name of your business here on the thread of the broadcast, and you can advertise with the African History Network also. Current promotion, buy one month, get two months free. We have a few more slots left. We have three new advertising packages uh, to help you promote your African American owned business. Um, you can register for the online classes i teach on saturdays and sundays on sunday it is from the civil war to the civil rights movement and black power 1865 to 1968 we do this on uh 2 p.m to um uh, this is 2 p.m to 4 p.m this is a this is a 10-week online course that i teach and we deal with thousands of years of history and what leads up to the transatlantic slave trade taking place that's in the second class first class from the civil war to the Civil Rights Movement and Black Power, 1865 to 1968. Um, in each class, we go through and analyze about a 10, 15, 20 year period of history to understand what happened to us after slavery ended. We go into the Jim Crow era, uh, Great Migration, World War I, World War II, Civil Rights Movement, the Black Power Movement. That class is on sale $80, regularly $130. So you can use this information with your children also. I would say the information is PG-13. We have book references, articles, video clips, it's very well documented. And in this class here, we do this on Saturdays, ancient Kemet, the Moors and the Ma'afa, understanding the transatlantic slave trade where they didn't teach you in school. So we deal with thousands of years of history, what leads up to the transatlantic slave trade taking place. There's a preview of the class here also that you can watch right here on the uh, uh, homepage of our website. And we deal with, um, the, the the African presence in the Americas going back tens of thousands of years ago also, okay? So you can, we have uh, a bundle pack. You can get both classes for $120, they're regularly $130 each. We do the sessions live, all the sessions are archived and recorded. You can go back and watch them anytime. If you've taken classes uh, with me before, email me at show at africanhistorynetwork.com, AHN show at africanhistorynetwork.com, and you'll get a 50% uh, fifty percent discount on the, the bundle pack. So you'll get both classes for $60. Email me at AHN show at africanhistorynetwork.com. As soon as you register, you can start watching the content. You can join us in class this weekend. All right, we have to get out of here. Remember, at the African History Network, we focus on educating, empowering, and inspiring people of African descent throughout the diaspora and around the world because right now it's correct wrong behavior. It's not over till we win. We're kind of forever. We'll talk to you tomorrow. Peace. STEM Forward, helping our community find their place in the emerging fields of science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Join us for our monthly live stream on our website, stemforwardedu.org. Watch, subscribe, share. Also join our mailing list to stay up to date with STEM resources and opportunities. STEM Forward, the future is now. Watch, subscribe, share. The work that I do is larger than the fashion industry, it's larger than the art world, and I believe that I was born to bring newness into this world. I'm Kaima McIntyre, I'm 24 years old and I'm an artist. I create everything from paintings to jewelry design, metaphysical jewelry to be specific, and fashion design. The only reason why my prom dress went viral is because people needed it. Within a few days of going viral, Notori Naughton reached out to me and she's like, I saw your dress, can you make me a dress? I was equally as shocked to be asked by a celebrity to design their dress at the age of 17. That's just one person and the list just continues to go on to Janet Jackson, to Tyra Banks. It really hits home. That means that the discussion is happening on the grounds in real time. Abundant Capital Group is a real estate investment company with over 20 years of experience in real estate. They specialize in two areas of real estate. One, they solve real estate problems with creative financing solutions that give the seller the most money for their property. And two, they show individuals how to get a higher rate of return on their investment capital with real estate note investing. If you are looking to sell or need to sell your property, 
Here is what they provide. Market value offer, even if you have little or no equity, they typically pay all closing costs, which can be thousands of dollars. They close on a date of the seller's choosing and the seller does not have to be out of the house at the time of closing. They take the property in an as is condition and the seller is not required to make any repairs. Give them a call or email them today for a free consultation and see how they can help you with your real estate needs. Call them at 973-475-8488. That's 973-475-8488. Visit their website, AbundantCapitalGroup.com. That's AbundantCapitalGroup.com. And email them at ACG at AbundantCapitalGroup.com. Follow them on Instagram and Facebook at Abundant Capital Group. What does self-care mean to you? To us, it's an opportunity to reconnect with nature. A chance to create something remarkable. At Sage and Elm Apothecary, our handcrafted skin care and household products immerse you in Earth's sweetest nectar, connecting you to nature in a way you never imagined. See for yourself and visit us at sageandelmapothecary.com. Mental health and well-being have long been a taboo subject in the so-called African-American community. So I enlisted the help of mental health experts, thought leaders, and activists to help kill the ghost of Willie Lynch and heal from post-traumatic slave syndrome. We experience trauma a lot of times um, on a subconscious level. So sometimes something happens to us and we know that it's traumatizing, but we don't really recognize the extent of the trauma. Soul in Motion, celebrating 38 years in the arts. This energetic ensemble of dancers and drummers was started by percussionist Michael Friend and is led by choreographer, associate director, Pam Lassiter. Based in the Washington, D.C. area, Soul in Motion is now accepting bookings for Black History Month, Juneteenth, and summer festivals in 2022. Soul in Motion is also available for more intimate events, like naming ceremonies and weddings. To find out more or book your date, call 240-452-452. 1349 or send an email to info at soulinmotion.org Be sure to check us out on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. Soul in Motion, celebrating our history, our culture, our future. <laughs>